Yes, thank you very much for the nice invitation. My middle name is David, by the way, for today, so that's, uh, <laughs> that's for you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the physiology of post version malaise. Um, but I want to start with this image, because we uh, recently um, uh, got a very nice image made by an illustrator uh, that really highlights our work uh, as, as post exertion malaise. So you see here uh, someone uh, who is really being undergoing the fatigue uh, while, go while climbing up uh, doing the exercise. So this is a real nice image that we've recently made in collaboration with patient representatives that really represents our work. So really cool, cool work uh, so far. I'm going to talk about post-exertional malaise. As an exercise physiologist, I'm interested why people with long COVID and MECFS are not recovering and not, and not getting better after exercise training um, <clears throat> and actually worsen their, 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 their abnormalities. And we really focus on the skeletal muscle abnormalities. And I'll try to go through uh, the recent work that we've, that we've done and try to keep it simple uh, for you to understand. I don't think I need to explain this, this graph um, with the symptoms and the different hypotheses of, uh, of, 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 of MECFS and long COVID, but it's important to realize that, um, but we've, that in our work we focus on post exertional malaise that can, ex that can happen after a physical exercise, but it can also happen after uh, cognitive or mental exertion. Um, <clears throat> so fatigue essentially is something similar that can also happen uh, at the brain, but it can also be, be, be caused at the, at the muscle level. And we try to separate out those two factors in our research, and I'll try to convince you by the end of today that those two are really distinct phenotypes and distinct pathophysiology, pathophysiological mechanisms. Important is the definition of post exertion malaise. So we know that it's the worsening of general symptoms or the development of new symptoms within roughly 48 hours uh, after physical, cognitive, or mental exertion. The thing is that it's patient uh, dependent, the threshold over which it occurs is patient dependent, and it can also change over time. So one moment, uh, a patient can do a certain amount of exercise, and another day, that same amount of exercise can cause post-exertional malaise. We don't know why it happens, um, but we do know that it can last for days or weeks or even months when it's very severe. And of course what happens is that it really sets back the, the, the recovery of patients and the clinical symptoms that are, that are actually can go into a vicious circle downwards, spiral down. And we know that it overlaps with patients with long COVID and other post acute post infectious diseases. So it's not specific only for MECFS, but also long COVID. I think we've, we've discussed this already before. Uh, we now see long, the long COVID f um, uh, disease as an, as an under the umbrella term, term of MECFS. So exercise above this PEM triggering. Uh, threshold is counterintuitive counter, uh, or counterproductive for um, uh, rehabilitation processes. And it's not medicine. That's what we normally say to patients, uh, exercise is good for you. But not in, in these type, in, in, in MECFS or long COVID. The problem is that currently the, the diagnosis is based on a very unethical two-day exercise test. And I'll explain you why that, how that happens. Is that the first day a clinician can do an exercise test to to induce PEM and to see how, what the exercise capacity of that per, per particular per, uh, patient is. And the next day, they would ask to do the same thing again. But what happens then is that you, as a clinician, put the patient two times in a PEM uh, 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 episode, essentially, and can actually worsen their uh, future um, rehabilitation. So I really think that this should not be done by clinicians anymore. However, there are alternatives, for, such as the DSQ PEM, that's not perfect, as I also uh, uh, talked about with patients yesterday. Um, but at least it's, it's, it's better than doing this unethical um, uh, exercise test where you really get two times PEM. So what we in our research, I, uh, we focused, we didn't want to do a two-day exercise test to, to study PEM, but we wanted to do something, sim something, um, something slightly different. We, wanted to do, we opted for a two-day muscle biopsy test to see what are the changes occurring in the skeletal muscle upon a, a, a PEM episode? So what we did is we uh, recruited 25 patients with long COVID, and we also now have 25 patients with uh, MECFS and 30 controls. 
what we did is we took a muscle biopsy before, a week before the test. Uh, then we did at, at the calipermary exercise test, a similar test as what David suggests, uh, presented before, but not invasive. One, one way to study the whole body exercise tolerance, but at the same time to induce the post-exertion embolism in patients. We actually, we have, have to be careful here, but we only induce it in mild patients because they had to come to the hospital for multiple times. Because the day after, they had to come back to the hospital to uh, give another muscle biopsy. And with this, we could uh, di uh, distinguish uh, uh, the changes over time, but also the differences between patients and controls. So our study received a lot of attention last year when it came out. Um, <clears throat> it has actually been uh, cited uh, a lot of times recently and has been in the top 10 papers in the, in the journal. So we're actually super, super happy because it, it's, it really uh, made sure that the patients, that, that there is something wrong essentially with our skeletal muscle and it's not just physiological, that the change that happened in the body. However, uh, there were two letters sent to the editors uh, this year that I would like to dive into a little bit more in the next few slides. But before, uh, I'm going to summarize in short, easy terms what we found. What we first did was an exercise test. So this is the VO2 max test, the maximum oxygen uptake consumption from patients. And you see that, that on average patients have a lower VO2 max, but some, some patients had a relatively high VO2 max. So, uh, and that is because we have also included patients that were ex-athletes. So ex-athletes can still have a high VO2 max, but that doesn't mean that their symptoms are not real. They really all got post-exertion malaise and were really sick. If we looked at the skeletal muscle levels, we saw changes in the fiber type composition. So red muscle is, is, is supposed to be very good. You can do a lot of endurance exercise with, with red muscles. Um, we saw more red muscles in the controls and more white muscles, more fast fatigable fibers in the patients with long COVID and also now with MECFS. On the other hand here, so we, we saw a, a, a marker for mitochondrial function, and uh, Dr. Tronsat uh, has already alluded to this in his presentation. Um, we see changes in the mitochondrial density, uh, but they didn't, res re didn't relate to the maximum oxygen uptake consumption, the excess capacity, as, well, as was the case in our healthy control population. So we saw there was something wrong, intrinsically wrong, with these mitochondria. And that's what we looked into more detail. But to give you a summarize, summary slide uh, of, the, of the publication, we tried to differentiate the two factors uh, that contribute to reduced exercise capacity, but also things that related to the induction of post-exertional malaise. What happened is what the contributions to the reduced exercise capacity are the lower mitochondrial respiration in the skeletal muscle, more metabolites related to fatigue, so the lactate accumulation, uh, and other, uh, and other metabolites. More glycolytic fibers, as I explained, the white fibers. Uh, and also lower power output per muscle cross-section area. That's a sign for that, that they don't get the same output for the, for, for the muscle size that they have. These things are relatively structural, so they don't change very rapidly. So we thought, what are the changes that happen, that happen over, like, immediately after an exercise test? And that's what we found here. So rapid changes in the local and systemic metabolic, met, 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 metabolic changes we found in the blood and as well in the skeletal muscle. We found markers for damage inside the skeletal muscle. We also saw changes that, that related to the recovery. So probably previous PEM episodes that are now where the muscle is able to recover again, essentially. And that, that's something that, is, that we see more often, um, that, that recovery always goes in parallel with, with the muscle, muscle damage. We found signs of infiltration of immune cells, uh, particular T cells and macrophages, um, that we think relate to either the, the muscle damage or they do something else that we don't really know about. So that's something that we want to study in more detail in the future. Do there, is there something maybe related to autoimmunity? We don't know yet. We also saw amyloid-like structures accumulating in skeletal muscle. And um, <coughs> previous presenters, presenters have already highlighted to this, this, this the microplot theory that people in South Africa are, are working on. Uh, we saw signs of that too in the skeletal muscle. And we're studying this now uh, together with the team in South Africa. So we really found changes essentially that, that contribute to, to, to the lower 
uh, reduce excess capacity in others to the post-exertion phase. So there are really different types of uh, pathophysiology. After the paper came out, we were asked by an editor to, to summarize essentially what other people in the field have found as well. So we were not the first ones to, to see skeletal muscle changes in, in long COVID, uh, NME, CFS. Lots of other groups have found something similar. And here there is a whole array of changes uh, going from microvascular microvasculature, uh, infiltration of immune cells, uh, ion channel uh, um, uh, uh, dysfunction, more sodium accumulation in muscle, et cetera, et cetera. We don't really know why these happens, these changes happen in the skeletal muscle uh, in patients with long COVID and MECFS. The current hypotheses uh, are uh, uh, fivefold, I would say. We think there is maybe some local hypoxia or endothelial dysfunction that also the Dr. Trondheim uh, talked about. We don't think, and we'll talk about it in the next slides, that deconditioning contributes. So this one, we really try to debunk now. Electrophysiological changes can, 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 can be the cause of these changes. Autoimmunity can be, can be a factor that contributes to this. And also things related to central fatigue. So the neurological changes in the brain can affect how the muscle is being activated. And we think that that may contribute as well to feelings of fatigue, but maybe also the way that muscles are also able to contract. So to focus on this particular pathway, uh, we, the day before yesterday, not yesterday, yeah, the day before yesterday, we published this particular paper uh, on the preprint server um, where we highlight the differences that we see in the skeletal muscle uh, with long COVID and ME CFS, but we compare that to people undergoing strict bed rest because we got, always got the, the um, criticism this is just due to, this, to de deconditioning. And is that really the case? So, what we did is we, we compared our results with a BETRA study. And the BETRA study is, has been done in collaboration with NASA and ASA, where people, healthy individuals, healthy people, voluntarily undergo 60 days of strict head down tilt bed rest. Everything they have to do is on the bed. One shoulder on the bed, 24 seven hour. <clears throat> And what we did is we took muscle biopsies from the leg uh, before and after these 60 days of bed rest. So we could really see what, what are the changes occurring with bed rest and what are the changes that would that occur with the patients with long COVID and ME-CFS to see whether they are diff were the same or not. What we did see was that the VO2 max was similarly reduced. So here you see on the, on the, in, in the graph on the bottom right, bottom left, the VO2 max and after, before and after bed rest was reduced to the same extent as in the patients. So typically you would say, well, actually, so they're the same, so probably it's just deconditioning, right? However, that's not the case. Because what we found, and I'll go in, because I don't have so much time to unfor unfortunately to go into a lot of detail here, is that we saw completely different adaptations in the skeletal muscle upon, um, uh, with patients with bed undergoing bed rest and people going up, up or patients with long COVID and MECFS. On the level of the mitochondria, you see here in colored in, 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 in dark, the mitochondria, uh, in bed rest and in uh, before and after bed rest, there was a nice correlation between their the function of the mitochondria and their exercise capacity. And again, as I showed you in the earlier image, we only saw that in the healthy controls and in the long COVID and in the ME group, we didn't see any correlation between the two variables. Same happened to the capillary, capillary supply. There, were no, there was no link essentially, or the, the, the adaptations were completely different in, after bed rest compared to uh, what we saw in the patients. So we really think that there are separate entities and separate um, changes occurring. And the disease probably made these changes independent of the deconditioning. So what is now the practical implication of our work? Of course, uh, um, and uh, David mentioned already, the pacing that people uh, are, uh, are, 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 are advised to do. Um, and patients are advised essentially to, uh, to, to exercise below this unknown threshold. But what is this threshold now? What can we do to, to study this in detail? Can we find this threshold? And this was a, a study done by a master student recently uh, who did this work in collaboration with a local sports physician. We thought maybe heart rate variability gives us ideas about what this threshold is and can, can we use it as a pacing uh, mechanism. Indeed, heart rate, uh, heart rate variability is, on average, reduced 
um, in patients with, uh, with, in this case, long COVID. <clears throat> they all got the, the CCC criteria, by the way, as well here. But you see a lot of variability. So during sleep, eating, traveling, and other activities, you see a, 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 a big variability in the patient's responses compared to the healthy controls. On group averages, they are, they are lower, but it's not on the personal person-to-person -person basis. What we found, however, was that the, the gas exchange threshold or the VT1, first ventilatory threshold, can be regarded as a practical surrogate marker for the PEM threshold. What we saw, however, was that in, uh, when people were excising below this threshold, that uh, the healthy controls in white, the mild patients and the moderately uh, 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 ill patients, um, they, they did recover. But not so. But but the the the, um, uh, the moderately severe patients only recovered or increased their heart rate variability more than 12 hours after the exercise. But you see that when when there was intense exercise above this particular threshold, that for all for the mild and the moderate patients, we saw a very distinct. Um, um, uh, later time point at which the heart rate variability starts to increase again. And that's something that we think that is, that is bad for the, for the recovery of patients. The heart rate variability needs to recover to higher values that is, that is regarded as, as healthy. We also spotted, and because of time I cannot show you this, sleep disturbances when you exercise above this particular PEM threshold. So what are the take-home messages? Um, many patients with long COVID and CFS are suffering from post-exertional malaise. Uh, I really want to highlight that exertional dyspnea or fatigue are not the same as post-exertion malaise. They're really two different ent entities. That exercise above the PEM threshold is counterproductive for recovery, and this threshold is, is patient and time-dependent. We know that distinct factors contribute to this, this the reduced exercise capacity, fatigue, <coughs> but also others to PEM. But we really don't know what these mechanisms are, what is the underlying X factor that triggers the PEM. That's really something that we'd like to <coughs> work on in more detail. What we also showed more recently is that the skeletal muscle alterations that we see after strict bed rest are completely different from what we see with post-viral diseases such as long COVID and MECFS. And practically, we now see that the gas exchange threshold, this is not graded exercise therapy, by the way, uh, people are maybe gets uh, allergic to that term, but it's, this is the gas exchange threshold, can be seen as a practical PEM uh, threshold. And with that, I would like to thank uh, uh, my colleagues uh, and you for attention, and it's been really wonderful to be here in Norway. Thank you very much.